Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The State of Facilities at CICU Institutions, uh, presented by Sightlines with Jay Perlman, Associate Vice President of Sightlines, and our very special guest for today, uh, Steve Bologna from Hamilton College, who is their Associate Vice President for Facilities and Planning. My name is Eric Nolan. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at Sightlines, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and I'd especially like to thank Jason Kramer and the folks at CSU for giving us this opportunity to speak with each of you today. Uh, we are thrilled to welcome you all. Uh, now, before I pass off to Jay to get us started, I'd like to remind you all that if you have any, any questions or comments during the presentation, please don't hesitate to share those with us. Uh, we will be monitoring them throughout the presentation and responding to them as they come in. Uh, so to, to submit a question or comment, comment simply enter into the questions box on your GoToWebinar window pane, and they will be sent directly to us, and we will respond to them as we get them. And lastly, following today's webinar, each of you will receive an email that contains links to both the presentation slides and the webinar recording for your continuing engagement with this material. Um, so look out for those emails later today. Um, I think that covers all the housekeeping items, and with that, I'll pass it off to Jay to get us started. Thank you, Eric. Um, I wanted to spend some time at the beginning first talking about the uh, agenda for today, and um, pretty simple. I want to quickly talk about who we are in the event there are um, people out there that have not, um, not um, worked with us or been exposed to our materials before. I want to quickly go into our view of some of the key challenges that are facing facilities managers Today, I want to talk about some of the national trends that we see and then, then drill down and, and see how that's affecting um, CICU institutions. I'm going to then um, transition in, into five strategies that we see work uh, out there and then talk about a few case studies um, where um, these strategies are in place. So first, to, um, to start out and talk about um, who we are, um, we are a facilities advisory firm, um, and in a nutshell, our um, mission is to provide the same rigor and analysis to facilities assets that institutions provide to financial and endowment assets. And how do we do that? Well, we, we try to find ways that you can use your resources more strategically and effectively. We, we have a very rigorous um, module where we measure, monitor, and benchmark facilities to identify and separate facts and fiction. And finally, we're able to document historical trends, provide you with consistent measurement across our members to help you benchmark and track your progress towards the objectives that you set. We have a fairly comprehensive facilities intelligence solution that begins with what we call ROPA Plus. And ROPA Plus is essentially our foundation for measurement where we define a consistent vocabulary and benchmark you against any one of of hundreds of institutions like you. Following that, if, if there is any um, you know, additional strategic analysis required, we have three other offerings. Our building portfolio solution is centered around defining your deferred maintenance and capital plans. Our safe utilization solutions are, are centered around um, you know, defining how well well used your existing spaces, and then finally our sustainability tools let you measure, monitor, and compare your environmental stewardship across other institutions as well. Um, we're very proud to work with <clears throat> hundreds of institutions every year. We have 450 colleges and universities as clients across the country and in Canada. Um, and, and, and two things that we're particularly fond of is uh, our retention rate, which uh, last, last year was 93%, uh, and the fact that with 
Uh, we've added over 100 new institutions since 2013. We'd also like to, to thank the 16 CIPU member institutions that we're partnered with, and it's their information and support that really makes a lot of the data that we'll be drilling into possible today. So without delay, what I want to do is jump into the national story and, and kind of define a lot of the why. You know, we hear a lot um, in the industry of, about challenges, deferred maintenance, capital needs, uh, declining operating spending. But, but the real question is, well, why is this happening and how can we address the root causes? So I want to spend a little bit talking about that. You know, we've all um, read a lot of the analysis out there in the big picture regarding the sustainability of, of higher education. And um, there are, in fact, a number of issues that are converging um, that are making life a little bit difficult in the industry. You know, we're seeing federal and state funding decline nationwide. Um, there are a lot of states where demographic shifts um, are, are really impacting enrollment um, and, and will continue to for some years. Um, affordability of higher education has been impacted in a way that actually decreases access. And, and, and finally, costs are up when you look at the administrative costs and spending in general. We are becoming increasingly dependent on tuition um, as an industry. Um, one recent white paper um, laid it out um, fairly well when they, they said this, approximately one-third of all colleges and universities have financial statements that are significantly weaker than they were several years ago. And, and that is essentially why we do what we do. And it, and it really brings us into facilities. And the question is, well, what does this mean for facilities management? And, and that is, if we think there is a disconnect in the industry between the the information that's available and the tools that are really needed to protect the assets that we have. And um, we can really best talk about this in, in a story. Um, and it goes way back to when we started this company in 2001 at a Kubo conference in Massachusetts. And we had a room full of business officers and, and we asked them a couple of simple questions. Um, we asked them, how many of you know the value of your endowment? Everybody raised their hand. We said, how many of you know your return on that endowment from last year? Everybody raised their hand as well. Well, how many of you know your draw rate on your endowment? Again, everybody raises their hand. We then kind of shifted it a little bit, and we said, how many of you can answer the same question about your facility? We said, what's the replacement value of your facility? What about your deferral rate? reinvestment rate. And pretty much all the hands went, went down. And the disconnect there is that higher education administrators have rigorous tools for managing endowment assets, but they don't have the same tools for managing the financial assets, about the facilities assets. And what's fascinating about that is at all but the wealthiest institutions in the country, the facilities are worth four to five times the endowment. And in this period of, of growth that we're coming out of across higher ed, that multiple becomes bigger and bigger. Um, it, it, it flows into a quote that I want to bring up, and it basically goes to the theme of, well, how do we close this, this gap? And the theme is, you know, one side effect of the rapid growth campuses has been the creation of incredibly large obligations for the future renewal and replacement of physical plants. And what's fascinating about this is that it really sounds like a lot of what we're dealing with today. But this quote was actually written in 1980 by Rick Steenway, who was then the founder of the Pacific Partners Consulting Group. This is a 35-year-old quote. 
And the data that we're going to drill into now kind of backs this up. Um, if we go into the next, next slide, this is sort of one of the most important graphs that we talk about today. And Eric, if you could hit the button one more time. Sorry about that. Um, so we call this the, the camel hump chart um, for obvious reasons. And it really represents the root cause of a lot of, of the issues that we're, we're struggling with today. And the quote that I had on the screen a minute ago was, was Rick really talking about this peak that we saw in the late 60s and early 70s? And we call this the post-war expansion. You know, when we look at across all of our institutions nationwide, and we grab the construction age on the axis, over 40% of campus space today was built during that time. And, and there's a pretty important reason for that. We have the GI Bill, we have the space race, the Sputnik era, the baby boomers. Um, we needed a lot more infrastructure, and so we built it. Um, we call these the post-war facilities today, and all, most of our institutions have them, especially in this region. They're the buildings that are typically brick with flat roofs, aluminum casement windows. Um, they're oftentimes not the best construction, and, and they need significant repair today. Rick's article um, that that quote was from was written at a time when this wave of building needed its first keep up cycle, minor life cycle before becoming due, 1980. Um, and in the 1980s, there were a lot of different things that you could do um, to satisfy those needs. You could increase enrollment, you could raise tuition, you can borrow money. You can appeal to the state for support. You could even do some endowment spending. Most institutions, they did one or more of these things. Um, the real issue is that we didn't stop the building for that long. And there's a second peak of construction, the late 90s to mid 2000s, that coincide with the tech bubble and the mortgage bubble, um, interestingly enough. Um, these, the spaces that we built during this era tend to be better quality. Um, they are more complex with higher tech controls and better finishes. The issue that we're faced with now is that the post-war buildings are now not facing their first keep-up cycle. They're nearing 50 years of age where they're approaching a major catch-up cycle, big renovations, resetting the clock. This is happening at the same time when those, these newer complex era buildings are approaching their first catch-up cycle. So we have compounding needs, the two major groups of facilities on our campus nationwide are approaching major life cycles. Um, the, the problem is we can't do those things anymore that we did in the 80s to raise money to fix it. Uh, high school graduates are level or declining in most states. Tuition is outpaced inflation for something like 30 years. Um, and these external funds like debt and state aid just aren't there anymore. And to top it off, the capital budget and operating spending, and we'll talk about this in the future slides, um, have not rebounded from the, where they were from before the recession. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the data that, that's driving this. On this next slide, you can see quick, uh, a quick snapshot of campus space and enrollment. And, and we really haven't stopped growing all, all, all that much. You know, we're seeing you know, the percent change in, in space. Our campuses are adding you know, somewhere between 3 and 4 percent every year to their campuses. The good news is, is, is that enrollment was increasing at, at a more dramatic pace. It, it, it has flattened out now, but enrollment has, has outpaced the growth of space nationwide. This is not true across all types of institutions. When you look at large research institutions, the pace of growth on the facility side has far outpaced the growth of students. When you look at smaller institutions and even mid-sized institutions, including CIEU, 
members, those institutions tend to be growing space at a rate lower than the rate of growth. And this is in, important because we, one of the things that we're going to talk about is the fact that we can't keep growing like we have in the past without adding to the denominator of current and future capital needs. Capital investment is down and, and has not has not responded, has not um, rebounded to where we were before the recession. Um, different on the public versus the private side, what is particularly interesting is that private institutions responded a lot quicker on the capital side than public institutions did. And I think the reason for that is actually fairly simple. And that is that it's a lot easier for a private institution to stop a project than a public institution. On the public side, that project was approved at the Capitol, at the State House. It's gone through the legislature. It's been advocated for by congressmen. It's a lot harder to slow that down than it is on a private campus that can put the brakes on construction renovation a lot more quickly. When you look at the next slide, there's a different there's a different way to look at this that I think is, is fairly important, um, and that is the mix of spending between public and private campuses since the recession is also fairly interesting. Public campuses split their spending between new and existing space. Private campuses much more of a heavier focus on putting dollars into the assets that they currently have, which is something that, that we um, tend to advocate for um, in a big way. On the operating side, something else that is interesting is that budgets um, are going up when you look at uh, dollar value. When you adjust that for inflation, the purchasing power of our operating dollars has decreased since 2008. A little bit more on the private than the public side, but, but not a noticeable distinction. And this typically means, um, this typically makes sense when we see things like um, fewer housekeepers covering campus space, fewer maintenance people covering campus, campus space. The result of the decreasing capital spending um, and the decreasing operating spending means that we do see increasing backlogs across, across the country. When we, we look at this across all of our institutions, we're approaching about $90 a square foot in comprehensive backlogs. And that includes things like deferred maintenance, modernization, and infrastructure across all of our institutions. There is some good news um, that I'd like to to share, um, we are seeing not only positive um, numbers on the utility commodity side, but we see consumption um, begin um, to go down. And with utility consumption going down and, and utility spending going down, as, as a result, we're able to put more and more dollars into plan maintenance in the recent year. So as we renew our numbers for 2015, I think we're going to see a lot of increase in capital spending on the back of the utility dollars. And we'll talk about more when we get to the strategies. But what this also means is that carbon emissions um, nationwide uh, are beginning to, to fall. As you look on the graph on the right side, um, especially um, where we're seeing a decline in uh, carbon emissions from utility um, per square foot. And this is, this is due to a number of different things. Um, the first is the reduced consumption that we talked about earlier. Another thing is um, the um, favorable commodities market has, has meant that a lot of institutions and very large institutions have been able to move from fuels like coal and oil to natural gas and renewables in, in a big way. So a lot of it is the fuel, the fuel switching that has happened. So I want to shift gears a little bit and, and point out some things that make the CIEU institutions a little bit different 
Um, and I'm going to ask Steve um, to comment on this as we go through this, just because of his experience at um, at at um, Hamilton College mirrors a lot of what we've been talking about. The, the, the first thing and the most important thing that I wanted to call out are, are, is the diversity of life cycles. And this is so in, important um, to what we do that um, what we've done is we've just posed the construction age of all the square feet from EICU institutions across the same head of active. And what's interesting is that we still have that, that spike in, in, in the post-war era, and, and we still have somewhat of a, a spike in the late 2000s, but it's a little bit more distributed across the era. We have a, a pre-war spike in the 30s. We have a, a smaller spike in that, in that baby boom expansion era. And we have two smaller spikes in the modern and the complex era as well. This is actually a favorable thing because what it means to us is that a lot of those needs are coming due in years that in a way that is, is not compounding. When you have different buildings of different eras, needs that happen on a cycle as things like roofs and boilers and chillers do come due at different ages. It gives you an opportunity to plan longer term and not have the large growth in deferral that a lot of schools are experiencing right now. I'm going to jump ahead a, a slide and look at Hamilton. Hamilton has it a little bit different. They have larger spikes than, than these other schools in spaces that are built early in the 1900s as well as a very prominent era of expansion around 1970, and then much, much smaller growth going forward. Um, and I, I'd like Steve to kind of offer some, some commentary on what this has meant for him and where he's had to invest a lot of, of his time and effort. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing for us is that most of our facilities that you see in the big spike are, of course, from the growth of the campus, our, our Kirkland campus, which is, uh, which is about 40% of our square footage. Um, and then as we've, got, as we've gone forward, a lot of the renovation, a lot of the works that we've done in the complex period is, has been mostly additions to existing facilities. So we've added to um, our facilities in square footage, but most of that has been in, the, in, in as a part of renovating an older facility to bring it up to its current code. And so some of that effort has also been placed in replacing uh, roofs and uh, mechanical systems, uh, envelopes, as a part of those renovations of the older facility and has, has helped us uh, manage some of that, uh, you know, the deferred maintenance has, has reduced our, substantially reduced our deferred maintenance for those particular facilities that were in that uh, post-war era. That's great. Yes. I want to talk about the next slide. We've seen at CIEU institutions um, a real decrease in overall utility um, consumption, um, much more exaggerated than, um, than the national statistics. From 2008 to 2012, a sizable drop in fossil fuel consumption. It did give a lot of that back, although not all of it, in the more in recent years, and mostly those are driven by climate. We had some pretty harsh winters that really dictated fossil fuel consumption. However, when you look at the next graph and you isolate the two fuel types, electric usage is, is down. Um, almost uh, across the board, we've had a lot of institutions that have concentrated a lot of effort specifically on the electric side, and that's, that's generally not all that um, weather driven just because of what that fuel is typically used for on campuses. Um, I want to put a slide up on the, the, the screen from, um, from Hamilton 
talk about their um, electric consumption, which has settled out and, and even dropped at a time when they're actually increasing space and users at the institution. This is one area where we, I think we've, we've really tried to work hard on is as we've increased the amount of square footage uh, of the campus through these additions and then more recently two brand new facilities for the arts um, that we've been successful at, at keeping our, our, our electrical use below that of where we were at in 2009. The, the biggest piece here has been focusing in on, on on using the rebates, uh, using uh, National Grid as well as uh, the NYSERDA rebates to, to assist us in, in, in using up and, and taking care of our lighting control systems, uh, lighting systems, some of our flood loads, uh, and, and really trying to focus in on doing this on a, on a regular basis and just taking a look at small projects. Um, if you, if we've gone back into the earlier periods uh, we've had a, we had a very much higher usage up at 26 and a half million, um, but when we put the science building online, but even when, and we did that by um, later on reducing it by actually going back right to doing a retro commissioning of the facilities five five years after we did it. And I want to mention too that this is also in 2014 uh, and even in 2015, which is not much different than what it's currently showing here for 2014. These tough winters have been really hard on it, but this is also the result of the fact, too, is that much of our heating load uh, for about 20% uh, of our campus is electric resistance heating, which drives our, our electrical load substantially. So I just want to, so you, if you see the fact that we've been able to reduce our overall uh, load has been a result of just doing a, a focus on trying to address those things. Great. Thank you. The uh, next trend um, and, and one of the final trends that I want to highlight specifically for TIC institutions are uh, operating expenditures. Now, we looked at um, earlier in, in, in the year, um, I'm sorry, earlier in the slide deck um, that over the years um, we have lost ground um, in operation spending um, with respect to inflation. Um, and at TICU, institutions that is not the case, or at least to the extreme that it is nationwide. Um, we've only lost ground to inflation for the last roughly eight, 18 months. Um, but what's particularly um, good to see is, is the fact that there's been a sizable increase in plan maintenance um, as a result of that. And, and generally when we begin to see decline in, um, in operating spending, we see that uh, plan maintenance and the recurring capital requirements of the campus are oftentimes the first things that are reduced as, as we try to uh, manage the bottom line, and that has not happened here. We're seeing an increase in plan maintenance spending across the board, and we have not seen um, that great hit um, as a result of uh, inflation following the recession. Great. So I'm, I'm going to jump ahead now and, and you know, we, we've talked about a lot of the negatives out here um, and I, I want to talk about, you know, five strategies that, that we see working across the industry and that we've specifically actually seen in play at CICU institutions. Um, and a lot of it comes down to a new conversation on campuses. And it's a different world today than it was in the 80s when we first started talking about this with Rick Edenwick's quote. And that is, we can no longer grow our way out of the situation we're in, uh, that we're in. The answer to our problem isn't adding more students and it's not raising tuition and, and it's not, of course, it's not borrowing money. Um, we're in a reality now where there's simply not going to be enough money to fix everything. And the question is, how do we make the most out of the resources that we get? And how do we make sure that the decisions that, that, that we make are consistent with the mission and strategy of the institution as a whole? And what that means to us is bringing together a 
conversations at an institution that historically have happened distinctly from one another. And it's creating policies that that definitely enhance decisions that are that surround space, capital, and operations. We're able to have a dialogue on, on campus that brings these three together, we're able to make sure that the institution allocates and resources to the most appropriate items. I'm going to talk about what, what five strategies to do that, that kind of bring people together are, um, and, and to go over them quickly, um, those strategies including building strategically, um, the concept of less can be more, um, people need to look look ahead, um, keep up is, is still important, and then finally rewarding saving. And I'm going to go through these um, with a couple slides for, for each. I'm going to start with this idea of less being more. We're seeing policies at institutions that are being put in place at the highest level with the goal of controlling overhead at the institution. And that is, we've been in an environment for quite a while where we built a lot of space and there was always an incentive to create more. Well, that, as we talked about, that increases operating needs, it also increases ongoing capital costs. So we're seeing a lot of institutions do some fairly interesting things and make some tough decisions regarding space. A couple of policies that are out there, the first one that we see is no net new space. And this has its roots in the, the sustainability movement. It basically says that we will not build any new space on, on campus without the removal of an equal amount of sufficient space. Um, we see this at a lot of institutions that, you know, they think they have enough space and it's just a matter of using it more effectively. There's another common thread that we're hearing out there at a lot of institutions that are called that called no net new backlog. And that is somewhat comparable, but we will not build anything new without mitigating an equal or greater amount of backlog on the campus. So we will renovate a building if that renovation accomplishes the removal of a substantial amount of backlog. Or we will remove an older building um, with significant needs and replace it with a newer, more effective space. Um, I've got one example that, that follows. This is actually the University of Massachusetts. And um, University of Massachusetts Amherst campus has actually reduced their backlog by 24% in, in real dollars um, in about 12 years. And the way that they've done that is by doing exactly what we just spoke about. It's making tough decisions about the spaces that exist on campus. They've been replacing spaces, they've been removing spaces, um, they've been renovating as well, but where it makes sense. And as, as a result, they've actually achieved a 24% decline in, in, in backlog, which is maintenance, modernization, and infrastructure across the campus. I want to talk about Build strategically. You know, build strategically is really Im important. If, if, if you do have to build, you know, we have talked about why not build. If you do reach a point where you're going to be adding space, make sure that you're adding the right space. And, and, and this is an interesting um, story from an institution that if you just looked at the numbers, you know, adding space made a lot of sense. It's an incredibly dense campus when you look at users per square foot. And this, this is a campus that, if, if you look at the size, has 7,500 more people on campus versus institutions of, of, of comparable size. Pretty dense, pretty busy. And when you looked at a classroom utilization report, which we compiled for them, it also made sense. It was very difficult to schedule classes in a lot of parts of the day. Um, and a lot of the time, the utilization of classrooms was in the 90% range. So 
yes, they could expand classes into hours where we had underutilized assets, but, but that wouldn't solve the problem. You, you, you still had times in the day when um, you, you definitely had um, less space available. But when we looked a little bit further, it was pretty interesting. And that is, the issue wasn't the, um, the number of square feet that they had. The issue was the type of square feet that they had. And functional obsolescence was really what was driving the need for a new building. And if, 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 if you look at the numbers by type of classroom, you would see that we were teaching a lot smaller class sizes, but the majority of our rooms were 31 to 35 students and 36 to 40 students. And, and just to look as, as an example, 17% you know, of the rooms could hold more than 40 students but there were no classes of that size in those rooms. It wasn't necessarily that they didn't have the square footage. It was the wrong type of square feet. So this was a case where instead of adding a new building, a much less expensive renovation, realignment of space that really involved breaking down some larger classrooms into many smaller classrooms, um, working session rooms, conference rooms, rather than larger le lecture halls, um, freed up enough space and solved the problem without the need for a new building. The next thing is we've already talked about build strategically. Well, you also need to um, repair strategically. And, and we, we find that uh, capital planning process that makes sense has to tie to mission and the finance of the institution. And you know, typically what we see are um, institutions where there's a needs assessment done, and then that's essentially a giant list of, of needs, and then that list is used to kind of fuel the project that the institution picks. And we think that that actually misses an opportunity because what, what, what people oftentimes don't really do is, is harness a lot of the operating knowledge that's latent in the organization. They don't tie mission strategy or master plan. Um, and it doesn't take financial capacity in, into account. So we would actually advocate a process by which you're able to take that technical assessment integrate it with your operating knowledge, your capital needs, and create what we call building portfolios. Building portfolios are, are the way that, that we think institutions need to think about breaking up the backlog, which can seem like an unsolvable large number. Break it down into components that reconcile with strategic initiatives at the institution and make decisions and investment strategies that tie to those institutions. And the whole idea is that not every building is created equal, and therefore a common investment strategy that works for every building is probably not necessarily appropriate. If you can click through, here's an example of a portfolio strategy where a large you know, $250 million backlog is broken down into several smaller components that let the institution plan resources to invest based upon what they think the priorities are at a strategic level. This is something that, that Steve actually does here um, on his own. And if there's any comment that he likes to offer, I'd love to hear how this kind of impacts the way that, um, that he allocates capital going forward. I think we're, what we've tried to do here is, is that it's, it's, it's not necessarily as formalized as this, um, but as we take a look at our, our, our long-term planning uh, and what we've done, at least with our, our more, more recent construction, is focusing in on 
those areas where we, we do have um, a strategic plan. Uh, we focus in on how what what areas that uh, what, what funding we have available, uh, both in our annual budget as well as the gifts as well as bonds, and try to adjust that to, to meet those particular needs, knowing full well that in some of in some of the uh, more uh, mundane renovations of our residence halls, we may not have been able to get potential gifts, as it's not may, may be noted here on the slide, but we've been able to re renovate those with um, with some of our renewals, uh, annual renewal gifts or annual renewal funds, and focus in some a lot of the gifts on on those things that are really student related and athletic related. Um, and and as a result, we've been able to accomplish a, a fair amount of work at least in the last five years that, that has focused in on, on uh, facilities that have been of a need for, for the strategic campus. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to uh, look ahead, um, which is another interesting strategy. And it, it's important that we're not only looking at the needs of today and the needs of yesterday. Essentially, you know, the definition of uh, backlog is looking at things that we didn't do yesterday. Well, the question is, how, not only how do we accomplish those, but it's how do we look forward? How how are we more proactive with um, with those needs? And, and here's an example of a campus that I like. It's a relatively young institution, as as you see. You know, we always like to array campus as far as, you know, the groups of, of ages. And you can see that a large majority of the buildings on this campus are under 10 years of age or either you know, or 10 to 25 years of age. And these are relatively low to medium, what we would call low to medium risk facilities um, that probably have low backlog um, but could have needs coming in the near future. When you looked at a deferred maintenance system, estimates that they had done. It, it kind of showed this. And the priority one needs, which are you know one to three years, literally were, were, were almost zero. Um, and a lot of those were very well managed as far as just routine work work done by the institution. When you look at the priority two, it's oftentimes three to five years, three to eight years. Um, also very modest. And you have $2.1 million in priority two needs, what was really interesting was that because the campus was of such light age across the buildings, with a large part of the campus constructed at one time, a lot of the cycle needs were coming due at one time. And that was in basically year 8 through 12. It wasn't that you had a large backlog today, that if you looked at it, it became very advantageous to think about the coming needs in the future. If we plotted the cash flow requirements going forward for that institution, even though their capital spending to date exceeded their um, their renewal needs, if you looked at you know five to eight years from now, those spikes were coming. Um, and and that was um, pretty apparent. There were two approaches that um, we gave this institution as we looked ahead, and that is you can either try to raise the base, which is basically increase your annual stewardship in a way such that by the time that those spikes roll around, you have the funding to do the project as they become due, or lower the peak, which is basically see if there are any of those needs that you can address ahead of time or in the low years, like 2019, to spread it out in a way that the peaks don't become due in one year, but you can plan a way to flatten out those needs and still accomplish all that work. And this is uh, another example about how we were able to show that institution an appropriate investment level going forward that recognized backlog, took into account future high-risk needs and plan a way to accomplish that looking forward. There are two final strategies that are relatively quick. Um, keep up. 
is important. We've talked about stewardship and we just talked about making sure that you have the dollars in place to take care of your future needs. But why is that important? It's important because um, numerous courses in the industry you know, continually show that a dollar invested in plan maintenance on cycle today offsets multiple times its value in emergency repair needs and capital needs in the future. It is always less expensive to do your oil changes in your car than it is to do the engine rebuild when you miss them. Um, and the payback is relatively sizable on that. And the final strategy that I want to bring up is rewarding savings. And, and this, is, this is very um, interesting. And I'm, I'm going to bring up an example of an institution um, where this actually worked very well. This was an institution that saw a tremendous decrease in utilities over five years. They spent a lot of time and effort not only managing their commodity side, but managing the consumption side. So you can see a 19% decrease in consumption in five years, coupled with um, a rate decrease of roughly 6% every year. That compounded to be a 24% decrease in cash expenses utilities over, over five years, roughly $9 million. At that point, it goes to policy. And what's the policy at the institution? And we were able to, along with them, advocate for a policy that said, if we can save this money, we want to be assured that a portion of it, if not all of it, were recycled into the infrastructure of the campus to make sure that the impact that we've made on utilities keeps on rewarding the institution going forward. And if you look at this, what's, what's interesting here is that Project spending did go up over the years, but it's very obvious to see the impact of that knowledge when you take out the space renewal work. So take that out and look at the increase in spending on building systems, envelopes, and infrastructure. And this is spending that was directly attributed to the fact that they were able to take the money that they saved on utilities and funnel it into the facilities in a way that um, was able to preserve the gains that they made for years to come. Sure. sure. Uh, and Steve, I know you've seen a decrease in utilities over the years. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to recycle any of that back into space. We do it in two ways. Um, and, and we not really don't have a formal policy about it, about it, but we do have an agreement that if we can try to uh, save a, a, a good portion of that, a good portion of all the savings that we've had over the last four years, five years, um, in our in our uh, energy budget, has, which has been averaging something between a half a million to six hundred thousand dollars, has gone back in. A majority of it, if not all of it, has gone back in at the end of the year because it is it's as a contingency piece. And we've been able to increase our overall uh, spending in infrastructure, um, uh, building renewal uh, budget to support that. Uh, and we put it back into uh, replacing mechanical systems in our residence halls, uh, boilers, electrical systems, and the like. And that it's allowed us to increase that amount every year to get us to, to, to at this particular point. And I want to mention that we do these small projects where we get the re any one of our rebates that we get goes into a sustainability pot. And we use that state sustainability prop pot when it grew large enough to do much larger energy projects to also further reduce our energy loads. Great, thanks. I um, want to stay on time. That brings us to the end of, of our data slides. I wanted to mention one thing. A lot of the material um, that we've seen today is available right on our website in our annual article entitled The State of Facilities in Higher Education. You can just uh, grab that. It has a lot of the, the graph that we've gone through today. Um, and we have a few minutes left, so um, I, I want to ask the, uh, the group if there's any questions or anything that um, we can help you with to follow up on a lot of the material that you've seen.
So at this point, we have had uh, no questions that have been submitted, but we can wait another minute or two. Great, thanks, Eric. Well, we'll we'll conclude now. Uh, we'll definitely stay online. If you have any questions to ask, feel free to uh, type them in. You can also email them um, if we are offline to info at sitelines.com, and we'll be happy to respond there as well. Thanks so much, everyone.